Okay, so we're back and we're going to talk about sleep and dreams. So here we have a cat in psychotherapy and uh, it's titled, When Cats Ex in Experience Insomnia. And the doctor says, let me get this straight. It's been two consecutive hours since you've slept? <laughs> Unbelievable! Because of course cats are on a different kind of sleep-wake cycle than humans are, right? Cats are on what we call a uh, ultradian rhythm. They sleep, wake, sleep, wake, sleep, wake, all, uh, multiple times all day. They sleep about 22 hours a day. Us humans are on a different rhythm than a cat. Actually, us humans that are over the age of probably four. Little kids, babies in particular, are on that same kind of ultradian rhythm where they sleep, wake, sleep, wake multiple times during the day. Uh, us adults are um, on a circadian rhythm which means that in a 24-hour period, approximately, we go through a full sleep-wake cycle. We have a big period of sleep and a big period of wakefulness, and the completion of that cycle is what we call one day, basically. We're designed to work on approximately a 24-hour sleep-wake cycle. The truth is, if you were left to your own devices, you would prefer, biologically, you would prefer the day to be about 25 hours. Uh, for most of us, we cut sleep out that we would normally want to have, so that's why most of us are, are sort of operating at a slight sleepiness deficit because there's really we truly are lacking one hour per day based on our biological clock. Now, what governs our biological clock is the, let's see if I, I haven't checked my videos to see whether you guys can see that arrow, but in case you can, I'm going to highlight this word here, suprachiasmatic nucleus. It's this line that's pointing at the structure that's right in the middle of the brain, right behind the eyes. Um, you see the light coming in, and then the light strikes that suprachiasmatic nucleus. The suprachiasmatic nucleus collects light information even when your eyes are closed. And so even when you're sleeping, as the sun starts to come up in the morning, your suprachiasmatic nucleus collects that information and sends that message back to your pineal gland to um, affect the production of melatonin, either increase it or decrease it. In the, in, in the light, you have a decrease in melatonin. As it becomes dark, you have a, an increase in melatonin. Um, so the suprachiasmatic nucleus governs um, using uh, light and darkness. It governs the functioning of the pineal gland, right? Sends information to the pineal gland is what I probably should say. Now, across this day, you not only sleep and wake, but you have fluctuating body temperature. Um, there's a reason why even when it's warm out and during the day you didn't need any kind of jacket or maybe you were wearing a tank top because it was so warm, at night you might need still like a sheet or a blanket over you because while you're sleeping your body temperature naturally, naturally drops. Um, across the day you have fluctuating arousal and energy levels. For most people, um, energy sort of dwindles in the afternoon. Between 2 and 4 p.m. for most people there's sort of an energy drop around you know that time. Drop in mental sharpness tends to accompany that. Early in the morning most of us are lacking in mental sharpness and we have to sort of wake up. Uh, so across the day it fluctuates. Our, our, um, these, these, these factors fluctuate. Um, it's not only across you know, like humans we have these fluctuations, but within individuals we have variations in how these things fluctuate. Some of us are larks, which I represented with the rooster crowing with the dawn, and some of us are owls, which I represented with an owl. Um, <laughs> the larks are people who um, tend to be most alert in the morning. They their best time for focusing is shortly after waking up, um, whereas owls are most alert in the evening. Larks are care typically little kids tend to be pretty larky, I like to call it. <laughs> They're morning people. Um, adults tend to be more welcoming of the morning than adolescents and young adults are. Even if you were an early rising child, in adolescence you usually will go through a period of wanting to stay up later and wake up later in the morning. Most of us will, through late adolescence for sure, and then into young adulthood, into like your early 20s, um, 
you'll display this the owliest behavior that you'll display of your life of your lifespan and then you'll tend to return back to more lark-like behavior as you get older um, you might know like your grandparents may be the sort who get up at the crack of dawn and you're like what are you people doing up already and they're like oh I can't sleep past seven or whatever um, that's very typical for adults not just you know grandparents but like adults in general I like to blame it on the birth of my first child because I had been very owly through adolescence and into well into my 20s I was in graduate school and so I was like 25 26 and I was sometimes sleeping through my 9.30 a.m. stats class. <laughs> so obviously I was pretty owl-like. Uh, and then I had my firstborn and, you know, babies need to eat every couple of hours. And so, you know, after a year of being woken up at, you know, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock in the morning by the baby, I kind of got into the rhythm of it and stuff like that. And I started becoming more of a morning person. I might have naturally become more of a morning person by the age of 30 anyway, because adults tend to be more lark. But I kind of blame it on she woke me up. And then it's funny because then she became an adolescent, wanted to sleep in. And I was like, you get to sleep in after you've now trained me to get up at 7 o'clock in the morning. This is not fair. But I really don't know if it's her fault or not. I blame her anyway. <laughs> now, when you fall asleep, you don't just drop off into unconsciousness and lay there all night. It used to be thought that that's exactly what sleep was, just this protracted period of literal unconsciousness where nothing happens. But then some researchers stayed up at night, all night, and watched some volunteers sleep and they realized that their bodies seemed to go through stages of deeper and more shallow sleep. And that got them curious. And then of course as technology advanced and the EEG was developed, uh, researchers were able to watch what was going on in the brain of sleepers and discovered that many times throughout the night you go through sleep cycles where you enter different um, brainwave patterns as the night goes on. So let's go through these brainwave patterns and what I've got on the screen is um, an EEG representing the brainwaves of a person who's awake. Awake and relaxed. We call this alpha waves. See how tightly packed the waves are? The, the waves are the teal blue part. The gray parts are like markers to show how much time has elapsed. The teal blue is the actual brain waves. And they're very dense. You know, they're very crowded up against each other. And they're um, sort of moderate in their height. They're, um, it looks like the brain's awake. Here we have on the on the right side. I cleverly put it sideways. You see those alpha waves as the person's falling asleep. They're they're pretty big and they're tightly packed. And then you can see the point at which the person actually drops off into sleep, and it changes. You can see that brainwave pattern change, and that's the that's the transition between awake but relaxed, and then now I'm asleep. So let's talk about the non-REM sleep stages. When you first fall asleep, okay, so you were in alpha, you're awake and you're relaxed. Then you transition into, it's called NREM1. It means non-REM. REM stands for rapid eye movement. We're going to talk about this later, but just in case you're curious. So your eyes aren't rolling back and forth. You're not dreaming. That's the key thing about non-REM. You're not dreaming. So here we are in non-REM stage one sleep. And notice how the brainwave patterns have, have become farther apart, right? The, the peaks between the, the waves are farther apart. Um, that's the key quintessential difference between awake but relaxed and then asleep. They're very small amplitude waves also. They're, the peaks aren't very high. Um, so we're, we've started to move into sleep. The thing about REM1 is that you may enter what's called the hypnagogic state, where you might have some hallucinations. Um, one of the project choices is to test the hypnagogic state and see what kind of hallucinations you might catch yourself having during the hypnagogic state. They usually are, are like floating or swirling or something like that, but sometimes people report pretty scary hallucinations like um, spiders coming out of their pillow or something like that. So. Uh, but the idea, oh, sometimes people will, will report that they fell asleep watching TV and then they, they hallucinated that they were still watching the this, this show. But when they startled awake, 
they realized that not only were they not watching it, but that actually a new show had started while they were sleeping. <laughs> they didn't realize it. So that's the kind of hallucination you might have during non-REM um, stage one. Non-REM stage two is uh, you can see some of the changes going on in the brainwave patterns. For one thing, on the far left, you see these clusters of tightly packed, kind of high, higher amplitude-ish kinds of waves going on. And then you have sort of the period of farther apart waves. And then see that one really big wave over towards the right? These are the kinds of changes that are going on in your brain as you're moving through stage two. Those clusters are what we call spindles. You get these little bursts of brain activity. Um, not exactly sure what these spindles are associated with, um, but they're very characteristic of stage two. We do know that people in stage two are most likely to sleep talk during this, sta this stage. So some people think maybe those sleep spindles may trigger, you know, like there's a lot of stuff going on in your brain at the time and that might be what triggers some people to talk. Um, but sleep talking is very common during stage two. Now, see how in stage two there had been that big fat wave over there on the right? Notice that in stage three, most of the waves look like those big fat waves. Um, when you enter non-REM stage three sleep, you get these very nice big waves that have long distances between the peaks. You can tell that the person is deep asleep. Um, in non-REM stage three, you are deep asleep. You are hard awake. Uh, you are really out. And during this stage is when you release growth hormone. This is when we think you're rejuvenating your body during sleep. You're doing the stuff that it'll take to, to make sure that you're in good condition. The last stage that we're going to talk about is REM sleep, rapid eye movements sleep. And if you look at these brain waves, you'll notice it looks a lot like the stage, the uh, alpha waves that are characteristic of a person who's awake, right? They're tightly packed. Um, it's, REM sleep is a weird phenomenon because your brain looks like you might be awake, but your body looks like you're dead. <laughs> so it's quite the um, paradox. What happens during REM sleep? Well, your heart rate and your breathing increase. Your heart starts to raise. You start to breathe more rapidly, more shallowly. Like you're, like a person who's watching you might think that you're, well, you've probably seen your dog in this state. And that rapid breathing that they do, we always say, oh, they're chasing a rabbit or something. Um, they're having REM sleep. They're, I don't know exactly whether they're chasing a rabbit. You might, in, in, uh, well, no, everybody, sorry. Everybody experiences sleep paralysis. During this period of REM, when your brain enters this particular wave pattern, it triggers a part of your brain to shut off the messages from the motor strip. We think it's probably in the thalamus. In cats, they severed a little spot in the thalamus, and that severed the connection from the motor cortex to the actual body so that the cats were actually able to act out their dreams. Instead of becoming sleep paralyzed, they got up and acted out their dreams. We think there's this little switch in your thalamus that normally paralyzes your body during the dream and prevents you from getting up and acting it out. Uh, one of the things that they found through those cat studies was that cats don't have happy little purring dreams. They have chasing things dreams, being chased dreams, hunting dreams, fighting dreams. <laughs> they seem to have pretty much very, I don't know, I, I would say bad dreams, but maybe cats like them, I don't know. Now I mentioned that REM sleep's a paradox because your brain is active but your body's immobile. Because of that sleep paralysis, your body can't move, but when we put you on an EEG and, or if we put you on a polygraph that picks up heart rate and breathing and, and um, sweating in your palms and things like that, you look very much awake but your body's completely paralyzed. So it's, it's kind of a paradox. How can you look so dead and yet be so acutely active in your brain? 
Uh, another thing that happens as a function of this general sympathetic nervous system arousal is that your genitals can become aroused. And it doesn't matter what you were dreaming. It has nothing to do with it. Back in the 80s, the olden days, I saw a comic who said, uh, it's so weird. It doesn't matter what I'm dreaming. My, my penis just always gets erect. It's like, oh, we're dreaming about baseball? Well, I'll be the bat. <laughs> and it's like, he was completely accurate. It doesn't matter what you're dreaming. It, but it's not like your genitals are getting on board with anything. It's just a function of the increased blood pressure and heart rate that the body's experiencing. So um, it's not about the content. So during REM sleep is the period of time when you dream. So uh, I mentioned that you experience sleep paralysis, so you can't act out your dreams. So I'm sure you're sitting there thinking, well, then how come people sleepwalk? We're going to talk about that later. Don't worry, I will talk about that. Um, now, every 90 minutes, you go through a complete sleep-wake cycle if you're a young adult. Young adults, um, if, if we look at the top panel, you're laying there awake for a few minutes. If, you're, if you fall asleep in less than five minutes, it's an indication you might be sleep-deprived. If it takes you more than 30 minutes to fall asleep, then you've got a little, maybe you've gone to bed too early, maybe you exercise too close to bedtime, or you got a little insomnia. Um, so you lay there awake for a period of time, then you descend into a very brief non-REM stage one sleep, a very brief stage two sleep, and then a nice long stage three sleep. Then you climb back up to stage two for a slightly longer period of stage two sleep, and then instead of going back into stage one, now you go into REM and have your first dream of the night. That first dream is only about maybe five minutes long, and then you go back into stage two for a little longer, and then you go into stage three, a little shorter than the last time you had stage three. Then you go stage two, then a REM sleep. Now for most of us, after about three hours of sleep, you have a little brief period of wakefulness. You might roll over, you might get up and go to the bathroom, um, whatever you might do. But for most young adults, you have that about three hours of solid sleep, a little brief, brief wakefulness, and then you descend back into the stages again. And then you have a longer REM stage. Then again, you might wake up again after about, about, um, about five and a half hours of sleep. You might have a little brief, brief wakefulness. And then you start alternating between REM sleep and stage two REM sleep. And then if it's a nice you know, morning when you don't have to get up with an alarm clock, you'll gently return to alertness through your alpha wave and greet the morning. Yay. Or if you're like me on most school mornings, you get jerked out of a dream by your alarm clock. <laughs> so either way. Um, so that's the typical pattern for young adults. Every 90 minutes you complete one sleep-wake cycle that ends, you know, um, with the onset of REM sleep and um, that'll take you 90 minutes at a stretch. Now you'll notice the older adults are a little wackier. For one thing, they don't spend very much time in REM stage, non-REM stage three little non-REM stage three when uh, when they first fall asleep. Got to remember, non-REM stage three is that body rejuvenating stage. And when you're older, you don't have as much stuff to repair. You're not growing. You're not pregnant. You're not exercising at the level that you did when you were younger. So you don't have muscle repair to do and things like that. If you want to spend more time in non-REM stage three, exercising more when you're older is a good strategy. But notice how older adults come slightly awake multiple times across the night. That's the really thing, important thing to note that's different between um, younger and older adults is those um, periods of wakefulness. All right, so enough on age. Okay, let's go ahead and stop here and we'll come back and talk about why we sleep and then uh, move on into some other topics.